Can you hear me? Okay, should be all right now. No? Okay, okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Roger Remington. It's always a pleasure to welcome all of you to our Design Conversations Lecture Series. One of the major programming events of the Benielli Center for Design Studies. We're very happy to see you here today. Just make sure you uh, remember that we have a speaker every month. So uh, come back again, and they're all really fantastic uh, people involved in, in design, one kind or another, and uh, uh, we work very hard to, uh, to make sure that uh, we bring this kind of really exciting and stimulating content uh, before you. So welcome, and uh, I'm gonna throw the ball here to my esteemed colleague, Josh Owen, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Roger, and welcome, everyone. Very exciting to have this dynamic duo of David Weeks and Georgie Stout with us tonight. Uh, I'll share a short story before I uh, introduce their credentials. Um, I've been going every uh, year uh, for almost 20 years now to Design Week in Milan, and uh, I went last year to the uh, Prada Foundation, uh, which is a really exciting and interesting um, kind of uh, cultural epicenter with art and design and architecture. And I was sitting in a cafe, and uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder from the table next to me, and it was David Weeks, who I've known for many years, kind of as a colleague uh, working in, in the product design sphere. And, uh, and we started talking and catching up, and I said, you know, David, we should really get you out to the Vignelli Center to give you a lecture on your work. And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to come. By the way, this is my wife. And I introduced, uh, or he introduced Georgie to me, and, and I said, oh, what do you do? And she said, well, you know, I run this little operation in New York called 2 by 4 And I said, oh, what's that? And she explained to me that it's kind of a powerhouse in the graphic design and branding domain. And I, of course, was completely ignorant of that. Um, and as soon as I learned about what a, an amazing um, character she was, I, it dawned on me that this dynamic duo um, would be a, slammed up for a double hitter tonight. Um, so we invite them both to come and talk about graphic design and, uh, and industrial design and the things that they do in those domains. So we're very excited uh, in that serendipitous meeting that, that, uh, that set us up for tonight's exciting talk. So thanks for uh, sitting at that cafe and reminding me that uh, I should bring you in. Uh, Georgie Stout is a partner and creative director at 2x4 where she leads a wide range of projects from extensive retail and packaging design initiatives to large-scale identity exhibition and environmental graphics and wayfinding programs. Past and present clients include Target, Nike, Barney's New York, Tiffany & Co, and Milan Goats. Her work in the cultural sector includes a series of exhibition designs for the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and branding projects for the Brooklyn Museum, Dia Art Foundation, uh, and Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, she has led product development for textiles and wall coverings with Noel, Marum, Blick, and Flavor Paper. She also collaborates with her husband and designer David Weeks in his furniture design studio, David Weeks Studio. David Weeks founded his studio in 1997, where he designs lighting, furniture, and household products and toys. He earned a BFA in painting and sculpture in 1990 from the Rhode Island School of Design. After graduating, Weeks worked with the jewelry designer, Ted Mooling, for several years before starting his own design practice in Brooklyn, New York. The studio manufactures an extensive collection of lighting and furniture for such clients as MGM Grand Las Vegas, the W Hotel, Saks Fifth Avenue, Bloomberg Philanthropy. His designs have been licensed and manufactured by Moroso, Kickerland, Habitat, and Areaware. In 2013, Weeks opened his own storefront and design studio in Tribeca. One part, of, one part storefront, one part creative lab, the venue has allowed him to create products and the environment where they are presented. All of his work is prototyped by hand and produced in his bed based manufacturing studio. We are so excited and fortunate to have you with us tonight. Thanks so much for coming, and I welcome you both. Hi, I'm Georgie. Thanks, Josh, for inviting us up. Um, I was going to tell a story about a meeting at the Fundazione Prada Cafe, and uh, it 
it was fortuitous that um, you asked us to come up here together. We actually never get to speak together. Because, um, you know, what we do is very different. Um, I'm in a design and branding firm which deals really with taking other people's content and problems and ideas and translating it into something that's an experience of some kind or a graphic expression of some kind. And what David does is much more about creating a kind of individualized, um, like his own work expressed in furniture and lighting and other things. So we kind of almost come to design from almost like the opposite sides of the coin. His very much coming from his experimentation and his personal expression and ours coming from trying to communicate something that is somebody else's brand ultimately for the most part. Um, but I do think that what we actually have in common is this kind of thread of our careers and we both went to RISD together um, where we met and um, we both kind of started our studios really young without knowing what we were doing at all and kind of worked our way through um, figuring out how to even run a studio in a city like New York and um, kind of reinventing as we go and uh, like growing our businesses in, in very organic ways. So even though we do very different work, I feel like there's a lot of common kind of thinking in terms of the way that we've approached design in a sense. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my studio, um, 2x4, which is a design and branding studio, as you mentioned, in um, Manhattan. And uh, it was very much a, a kind of coming together of friends in the beginning. I met my two partners, Michael Rock and Susan Sellers, also at RISD. Um, graduating in the late 80s. Um, and actually, uh, interesting fact, I think that computers were introduced to RISD like the year I graduated, so missed all of that. Um, completely self-taught in that sense. Um, here's a photo of us like in the, when we first moved to New York. I'm man-spreading. I thought it was a good uh, photo of me. So. We, after school, we all kind of went our own ways, and uh, I worked with a woman named Bethany Johns and did a lot of work in the cultural sector in terms of um, working for museums and galleries and artists, doing mostly print work. Susan and Michael, um, Michael actually taught at Yale for many years in the graduate design program at Yale, and Susan went to Holland for a few years and worked at Total Design and did some other things. And in 94, we met again in New York and um, we shared a loft and started two by four and started working. They had also done a lot of work in that kind of cultural sector. So we started in the print world really thinking about um, how to communicate ideas through print mainly. And that grew from uh, you know doing kind of catalogs of art um, exhibitions and, and different kinds of artist books to um, really kind of being almost a collaborator or an author in a lot of these pieces and really collaborating with the artists and with the architects that we worked with. And I think that um, a lot of that early work kind of informed how we grew the business ultimately and the kind of work that we do today. So now we've been in business over 20 years and we currently in our studio have architects, we have graphic designers, we have strategy people, we have writers, we have a digital team, and we have an environment team, which is kind of our, our hybrid name for somewhere between graphic design and architecture, so everything kind of in the space. And uh, we're about 50 people now, so we've actually grown pretty significantly over the course of our career. This is the view out of my window, and I like to show it because I feel like every day when I go into work, I feel like we've made it uh, you know, from a very kind of humble beginning to this place where I feel really sort of in control of my own destiny and, and the way that I get to work is really exciting and has grown so much. So we really, um, I think we've really like felt that we've been able to translate something that we had a passion about into something that's really a thriving kind of business model. Um, these are just a few photos of the current studio. One of the first projects that we did as we started out was to redesign um, 
this magazine called Architecture New York, which was a kind of almost a, a fanzine or kind of tabloid piece about architecture, up and coming architects that were starting to practice and um, in the early 90s. And this was with uh, Cynthia Davidson was the editor. and It was out of Peter Eisenman's office. And through that process, it was really for us a very graphic, um, a kind of experimentation with graphic design. So every issue looked different. There was an underlying grid, but it was a grid that was sort of completely um, organic to begin with. And so it allowed for all of this really crazy difference in terms of the way that it looked. And we forged some really close relationships in that process of working on that. And one of those relationships um, that kind of led us to built work was a relationship with OMA and Rem Coolhouse. And he was one of the first architects who then asked us to participate in helping him kind of express his work in other ways. So a lot of, he, he was just starting to do, um, really hadn't built in the States yet. And so we worked with him on his early um, competitions for, this was for Universal Studios in California. We worked with him on the um, MoMA competition and um, IIT competition, which we then went on to work on the building as well. And so these were kind of early experiments that we did with him and his studio, which took the idea of how do you communicate, in this case, a very complicated architectural idea, as well as a kind of program and a whole system of how you wanted to communicate that to your client, and do that in a way that's both narrative and sort of tells a, tells a story about the project, but also shows you how those different things happen. And also kind of explain the process a little bit. And so it always had somewhat of a sense of humor. It was a little bit um, didactic and had like a kind of uh, intellectual quality to it, which was all obviously about him and the way that he expressed his work. So when he started building, we, um, collaborated with him a lot. Um, and we started to think about how to think about graphics and design in physical spaces. And how do you do that in a way that feels really integrated in the architecture, which was really something that right from the beginning we wanted to not be a studio that came in and kind of put something on the wall after the space was done, but to really be somehow integrated in the process and be part of the execution, if you will. So almost like in the surface of the spaces we were working on. So this is one of my favorite early projects, which is just a completely bizarre um, project where the Hermitage um, Guggenheim collection was um, housed in this lovely uh, Las Vegas casino. And it just seemed like the epitome of um, a weird combination of Las Vegas and Rem Cool House, can you even imagine? So this building is a core 10 steel box that's literally kind of pushed into the surface of this hotel, which I don't know if you've been to Las Vegas, but a lot of the hotels are practically made of foam core. They're kind of like almost not permanent. And so the, the kind of irony of using this insane material was really like sort of his sense of humor. And um, we worked to integrate a whole, we did a whole graphic program for this, but this was just one of the elements, which is the name was actually, um, we worked with a person who helped us rust it into the surface of the core 10. So we just treated the typography and then let it rust over time so that it became more and more clear as the, as the um, space kind of existed. And then within that experience, we did a whole series of large-scale graphic interventions, always trying to really embed them in the architecture in some way. So here, um, these kind of large graphic doors that open up, and there is a tunnel from the parking garage that you had to walk through, where you literally walked through the name, and you could kind of look out through the typography. Um, and the scrim at the, at the very ceiling of the space was a a um, screen that was kind of retractable for the light that had the Sistine Chapel printed on it. So always kind of playing with messaging and typography and um, different kinds of graphics in those spaces. Um, this is a, a fun project that we got to do as well for, this is for the IIT campus in Chicago, and it was a student center 
which was um, entirely built underneath this elevated train. So it had a, one of the engineering feats of this project was a, a large kind of um, soundproof tube that had to be built around the train so that the building could exist under it. And we were asked to develop a graphic identity for the building, so not so much how should the name look, but what should the feeling of the building be and, and what should the personality of the building be. And so we started with this idea of a student and in a space like this and what would a student do. And so we started um, by developing an icon system, which we, we took a kind of typical icon and then started to give it all of these different kinds of activities. Most of them sarcastic and funny and thinking about like what do students do when they're not studying or when they're in this kind of a more a less structured center. And we created hundreds of different icons, um, some of which the client deemed not appropriate. Um, <laughs> but some of them made it in there. And then what we did is we used those students represented in all these different ways as a kind of pixelated system that then populated the space. So sometimes that meant that they made up the face of, for example, Mies van der Rohe on the front door or here um, the, the um, patrons of the school or the original founders of the school. So as you walk up, you don't, it's kind of a, a double um, way of seeing. You see the large portraits, but then when you get close up, you see the, the icons within. And then we did all kinds of different surfaces in the building. This was a flocked wallpaper we did for some of the conference rooms. And then also used it basically as a kind of wayfinding system or an identification system. So in the study area, representing students studying or in the coffee bar, this kind of idea of togetherness or at the theater entrance. So always playing with scale and with kind of a little bit tongue in cheek, but trying to basically embed this in the surface of that building. Um, this is a project we did with another architecture firm. And here we were asked to just think about the surface of this building. This is for the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky. So we were given very strict um, material palette of eight tiles, and they were two inch by four inch, ironically and um, asked to do something to represent Ali in some way. And so again, we worked with this idea of, of pixelization. So we chose a palette um, within that eight, eight color um, kind of variable and created these large scale pixelated images of Ali. The museum is located on the highway. So as you come into town from far away, you see these images. And then as you approach it, they kind of dissolve into a more of a a moire, almost of a, a kind of pixelated abstract pattern. So again, they have these kind of two readings in a way. We love to play with materiality and thinking about surface. Um, this I just threw in as an aside, but I loved um, this piece, which was just when we were developing the store for Vitra, um, the furniture line Vitra, with the architects, Lindy Roy, we were asked to do some kind of a barricade at the front while they were under construction. And so we took the logo and we just created it out of flyers and kind of stapled the logo onto there and pulled it off. So it was almost like a logo made out of garbage, which felt very appropriate um, in the meatpacking district of New York and kind of like tongue in cheek um, about that brand, which is a very beautiful Swiss furniture brand. Um, here for Chanel in Hong Kong, just playing with the surface of a building designed by Peter Moreno. They had put a series of screens on the building, but there wasn't really a program for what should play in those. So rather than the kind of typical fashion um, runway image, we developed a series of short films based on different ideas that we um, got from the brand. So there are a lot of different kinds of um, there was like the Camilla flower or um, these certain kinds of sequins or different things that were part of the brand language and we used them in different ways to create these short films that always resolved into the logo so it became both kind of filmic and brand identity. This is a larger scale project we did for Nike and um, here is a real departure in a way from 
what I've been showing you, which is more about kind of a surface, um, I, a way that you treat a surface and kind of infuse brand into a space through materiality. And this is a kind of full experience design um, program where we worked with Nike to develop a concept for the Beijing Olympics um, in, I think it was 2006. So they had a permanent space in um, the 798 district of Beijing, which is a kind of arts district there. And we created a, a new facade for the building that used this pretty low tech um, uh, technology called Trimedia, which is what you would see on the side of a highway, basically, for an ad that would, you know, when you see those ads that change. And so we used it in this way that kind of created this wave of um, imagery so that the front of the building always felt like it was shifting. And um, the project in this case was how to introduce Nike, the brand, to a Chinese audience. Um, obviously, everyone knew who Nike was. A sneaker company um, is what they thought. And so what we were tasked to do is how do we tell the kind of narrative of the brand? How do we talk about that they're actually a, res a deeply, like, um, they, they're deeply involved in research and they think a lot about materiality and their goal is always to kind of strive for something lighter which therefore is faster. And so um, we met with them in Portland and visited their headquarters and we met with a lot of the designers. We went through um, the process of kind of watching how they test a lot of the product there. Um, and then we went to the archives which were basically a warehouse full of cardboard boxes at the time um, and chose a hundred objects with the help of their curators that we felt would tell the story of the brand. Um, and so we basically created an exhibit using those hundred objects and through the exhibit you learned about the progress that they made um, with each new product and, and um, how uh, the early like Bowerman tests were made, you know, literally with like a, a uh, waffle iron, using a waffle iron to create a sole and things like that, or putting sandpaper on the bottom of a shoe and trying all of these different kinds of really interesting tests that helped them to develop more and more products that were faster and lighter weight. Um, and so we created this exhibit which was based kind of loosely on the idea of an archive and a locker room and a different things kind of put together and um, used a hundred objects and had an audio guide that was just uh, actually an iPod touch. It was before the iPhone came out and so we created a hundred uh, audio files which were done just as a playlist we had interviews with different athletes. We had a kind of lead curator who took you through the objects and you could go at your own pace. And for each object, there's a number. And for each object, you can listen to a story. And either an athlete or a designer will tell you a little bit about that object and how it was part of their heritage. And so really, it was a, a way to kind of bring the brand to life to a new audience in China and let them into that process a little bit. And um, it became a kind of also a, a space where they did lectures, there were films, they had a lot of different events there. And so the whole design of the space accommodated this exhibition through the center. And then on the end were a kind of uh, steps that you could go up to and you could visit upstairs, which was all about their um, forward, like the way that things that they were thinking about for the Olympics, so newer technologies the uniforms they had designed for the Beijing teams, et cetera. But you could also use those stairs as a way to sit and have a whole bunch of um, programming happen. So it was both, a, it, it was the first project where we really took an in-depth approach to a, a brand or a topic and tried to really blow it out in terms of content, storytelling, creating a space and a kind of experience that you could have with the brand. Another project that we've been working on for over 15 years is a collaboration with the brand Prada. We do a lot of work in their New York store. And um, this is a space that was designed um, about 
16 or 17 years ago, and one of the things, the challenges was how to keep it fresh and always evolving. And so here we worked um, to develop this one long wall, which is a, a non-repeat wallpaper, which we do new versions of every six months. And so it's a constantly evolving and changing. This was the very first wallpaper that we did. And you can see that it, it has, again, this kind of double read where it's a very large scale floral pattern. And then as you get closer, you see these little bits of imagery and different peaks into the product process. And then we always iterate on that wallpaper. So for the second version, we actually just did this big kind of blackout pattern where a dot pattern slowly was printed over that same wallpaper and it became eventually completely black. And so for each new collection that comes out every six months, we have a new direction. And there's, there's really no brief for this project. It's very iterative. Um, it's actually really fun for the studio because everyone on every team can work on it, interns work on it. Um, we have an in-house joke that the day that your design gets picked for the Prada wallpaper is the most exciting day and then the next day is the worst day of your life because you have to produce it. <laughs> and these files are enormous and really high res and so it's really difficult. Um, but it's something that's really fun because we can constantly iterate and change and think about new versions of this wallpaper. So in this case, we just made masks that went right over the faces of the previous. And in this case, we actually hired a series of oil painters in China to do these kind of copies of master paintings. And this is actually our homage to <coughs> Vignelli um, with a big kind of large scale brand manual that we created a false brand um, called the Gilt Corporation. And then we created a whole kind of brand guideline for that fake company and that became the wallpaper in the space. And then sometimes we try to think about um, how to incorporate technology as well. So for certain iterations we've actually done a lot of content outside of just wallpapers. So here we're incorporating a series of movies that get distributed throughout the space. Sometimes they're hanging in the clothing and you just come upon them while you're shopping or they're embedded in the surface of different um, displays. And a lot of times they're interactive. So these were a series of mirrors that we did where um, it projects your image back to you, but it's always filtered in some way. So here it's scanning you as you walk up to the piece, but it's always kind of stretching and distorting the image. So you never quite see yourself as perfectly as you would appear in a mirror. And a lot of the work we do with them uh, revolves around their fashion shows as well. So this was uh, one of their shows for uh, women's wear. Actually, that artwork was then used throughout the different stores as wallpapers and also in pop-up environments. So often we'll develop content and then it'll have a life after the first um, iteration and it'll go, it'll sometimes become part of the product and sometimes it'll travel to different um, locations like in their uh, store in New York or in Tokyo. And here you can see that same product being used, the same graphic being used in the product itself. This last project is um, more of a project that we baked up ourselves. Um, we were asked by New York um, by design to come up with a, an idea for how to talk about design during um, the whole month of May, which is now uh, kind of New York by Design month. Uh, used to be just when the furniture fair happened in New York, 
but they've expanded it to include all different kinds of disciplines and wanted a way to talk about design to the public in New York City. And so we were asked to create a piece, like an art piece almost for this. And we thought about it a lot and tried to come up with an idea that could be, um, that could kind of cross all disciplines and, and speak to different people in the design community, not just graphic designers, not just industrial designers. And so we came up with this idea of a uh, manifesto for all designers, and we called it <coughs> Multifesto. And um, you know, the idea was that design is, not, is a verb, it's not a product, and that it's a collaborative endeavor, not a mark of an individual. And so wanted people to contribute their ideas about what design meant to them. And we created this really simple way of putting in a verb, a preposition, and a noun, and then your multifesto would automatically be created. And we, um, here's David's. <laughs> we then created a whole uh, interface for it and had designers all around the city um, allow their different ideas to be played out. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of these now. And there's a website that kind of maintains the system, but then during design week, these were playing in all of the screens across Times Square, and they were playing in um, the taxis throughout the city, and became a really big part of how people understood design the city. And it, people felt really invested in it because they would see their name and their product up there. And it was, I have to say, really uh, thrilling to stand in the middle of Times Square and watch all of these screens play at once with all of my friends and, and peers' names appearing across all these different places. So this is a kind of project where we might, we just invent it on our own and kind of design as we go. And um, I think that's a really fulfilling way to do that kind of work. I think that doesn't come, you know, that's not that often that that happens, but I think that being allowed to kind of play in your own, you know, and come up with ideas like that is an exciting part of what we do now. And a lot of times we do um, a lot of inventing content now with the projects that we're doing. And now David's going to speak to you about his work. <laughs> It's always, I mean, our relationship is very interesting in the sense we both go to work every morning, but we don't talk about what we do when we get home in the morning, just because of everything else that's going on in the world. And um, I guess I'll roll it back a little bit. Georgie showed you where she started, and this is kind of more the point where I started. As she mentioned, I took a much more of an individual route in the process. Um, Exploring ideas, exploring materials, and just primarily based on curiosity more than plan. Um, back then, in 1990, there's no Google image search, so everything that we got and all the source material usually came from the flea market or vintage books. So we just went and collected all the stuff we could. Um, and at, you know, at the flea markets alone, you could just find so many odds and ends and take them apart and rebuild them and change them. Um, so this is one of the earliest pieces. It's the first desk lamp. That, this is a very polished version. <laughs> in fact, one's a little down and dirty. But um, yeah, it had an iron cord that I also got at the flea market, which is one of the first things that everyone was really excited about when I first started making lighting. Um, I was working for Ted Mulling at the time, and I basically just decided, like, I'm going to stop working there and just make as many desk lamps as I can come up with, with the studio I had and with the materials I had. Um, it's just all a funny process. It was very deliberate, and in the end, it worked out to be, I think, 10 desk lamps at the ICFF, right next to the bathrooms, in like a little, little space. But it was amazing what came from that. Um, great opportunities, and as I developed the line and the sort of the cachet started to catch up with the products um, and the opportunities and 
the commissions got bigger and better. This is a huge mobile that was designed for somebody's elevator shaft in their personal home. Um, this is a, the Hennon collection. Um, so basically, that became the way of, way of the world for me at that point. I never had the intention of being just a person who does lighting, but it fit so well and it worked well for a career and, and to keep the process of a studio thriving. So each year, we'd come up with another version of a large mobile or sort of a signature piece. Um, at the time, it was very much a part of making. I had a studio in Dumbo, Brooklyn, where everything was sort of experimental. Um, these are spinnings that were made in a full bottle form and then cut by hand and sanded by hand on the belt sander. Um, eventually, we found out there's a, something called a laser cutter. It made our lives a lot easier. <laughs> so this was the old shop. It was like really, really pretty basic. Um, but uh, we slowly developed the technology and it grew from one or two pieces to many pieces. This is one of the standard shades. It's all cut out of a suit. It's just a simple pipe, an aluminum pipe on a laser cutter that cuts all the profiles. Um, again, looking at these pictures when I set this thing up to last night, it's creepy. No. <laughs> No, it's just as I get back on when you get used to what you have and you make the best of what you do. So this is pretty straightforward, down and dirty studio. Um, the process that we were employing at the time was very much just one-to-one. -one. It wasn't about rulers or angles or anything computerized. It was very much like, I got an idea, I got, I got these pieces around, just drilling holes in pieces. This. Um, the model on the left is literally what ended up turning into this in the end. And the, all the, the actual proportions were based on the wood model. This is a, a good friend of great opportunity, William Wegman's little friend came. Um, the studio also has tried as much as possible to use different materials in different ways. We um, did a lot of sewing in the early days. And we developed this, a chair along with a, a lampshade that had followed the same pattern. So I just want to show this. This is a bit of kind of play on the um, butterfly chair. But the scene that's in the base of it, this is a habitat version. So it evolved one step further. And it took a very much another sort of evolution. The center seam of that piece is the same on the chair as it is on the lampshade. So, we're constantly trying to find things at different scale and find mechanisms and connection points. And always trying to keep your eyes open as you develop the process. This is a simple bowl, half a ball shade, that's squeezed with this very high-tech way of your hands. Yes, yeah, so this is just hand you know, squeeze. Then that turns into a, a silverware collection. These look great. Everyone thinks they're really super fragile, but they're just aluminum spinnings. Um, the final brass bowl, the nesting bowl. This is the fented desk lamp. We started exploring with cement and other materials. Always playing with different um, finishes, and different techniques in building. At this time, the, the studio had grown to such a point that we had, did lighting, but we also started doing furniture with uh, Ralph Pucci, the showroom in the city. And again, every project sort of feeds onto the next project. As the folds of the last one standing piece happen, this is the following piece. The sculpt lines. Um, this whole collection was proudly the PR for it was that there's no straight line in the piece, which ended up being a nightmare. So, because there's no way to actually set it on anything to test and see if it was level. <laughs> so, so that was sort of the end of this initial phase over the past 15 years. A whole collection of different things, the rug in the back, um, the furniture, the fiberglass piece. This is all the different stuff that was developed and have, has sort of made up the, the stable of the, 
the studio. But at the same time, there's also the darker side. developed this whole collection of lights and everyone had sort of sort of thought of me as that specifically. And having gone to RISD and painting and sculpture, the day I made that gorilla it was actually a moment I was like, that's that feels very much at home, very much like where I where I want to be. Um, so I started developing other small project products for companies like Kickerland and Aerialware. Mm -hmm. We developed votive candles for um, Kickerland. So they were votive candles, the lamp, the campfire, the oil drum, and the ski shovel. This went on to where we started doing the toys, which is really just sort of a process that kind of came out of just being in the studio and making things. Um, Again, we just would like carve all the pieces by hand and kind of work out the mechanisms as we went. They're based on the GI Joes from the 70s with the elastic bands on the inside. So it was just building all these components and then stretching the rubber bands in the middle of them. And I like the fact that these are sort of now, they're much more under the radar, but where people can make the connection between the lighting and the animals. We eventually did this for Kid Robot special, the Chisler bunny. And then there was Hanno. Um, just again to see the same process as it develops. The gorilla drawings for Hanno on the left ended up being the wallpaper or flavor paper on the right. Um, and I just, again, I like that opportunity in creating things where you can kind of keep mining your own process and your own, you know, prototypes. This was the ultimate wood stump in the face of Hanno, chromium bleed. Everybody needs one of these, so I'll be taking orders in the back. <laughs> then there's the cubot, which was um, kind of the distillation of all the animals to the simplest form. It was a trip. It's just a good day at the shop. It was um, an opportunity. We had developed all the joint systems for the other animals. So creating this one wasn't that complicated. It was just a matter of making the simplest thing you could make instead of the most complicated thing you could make. And then we took that to Prince of Milan, which is a big foam company in Belgium. And they agreed to make one piece for the Milan show, which is a fantastic experience. It's also spawned so many follow people are following. Um, this is a woman who is disabled, but she was totally fascinated with the Cubot. So for a while, she would come to the studio and she and I would draw together. And she would just like love these like crazy wild drawings. And then if you do go to Instagram, it's just like, it's incredible how many people are c connected to that product now. Um, so that now, we'll go back to the other end of things. This is on the, the store. I was with Ralph Pucci for a long time, 11 years. But then they got to a point where it was very much, the expectations were consistent. It was sort of like they wanted the, the same thing over and over. And I wanted to try out a different approach and to sort of see what retail would be like. Um, it gave us opportunities to do totally different installations. In the background, you can see the um, it's called the infinity screen, which is a sort of folded taco shell, thousands of times over. Um, or the boy sconce and multiples. We also did um, curated shows and collaborations with other people. This was Roger Stevens, who made all the brass baskets, um, the nesting balls. Oh, and I guess 
So, and after the first year anniversary of that, of this new store, we developed a, a small video as a promotional piece. sort of the, um, the first step at Canal Street. New York is such an amazing place that um, that was an idea that I was kicking around. I brought it to people at some work and they're like, yeah, let's do it. And they're like, so go down to Canal Street and find some people. And it was like, that's ridiculous. But um, that's exactly what happened. I walked into the first guy, Aziz, who did, played most of the pieces. I just asked him right straight up if he could tell that he was like a very together person if he wanted to do this commercial. And he was like, absolutely. So he got the other guys. We had to go down the street. He couldn't be on his turf. He was worried about like being seen. And then, um, but in the end, he was so concerned about getting as many YouTube views as possible. He was like, "Man, I got 20 more views today." So anyway, that was a great thing, and that was, and that's the first step for the store as we developed it. Up. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. So I'll get to this. So having the store and having your own retail possibilities kind of control your own destiny, has also become an opportunity to sort of explore your curiosity and your and whims. A friend of mine was working in, in Africa, in Senegal, with the same company that does Moroso's weaving pieces. Um, and when I heard that he was going on that January of last year, I bought a ticket immediately. It's probably one of the most gratifying and satisfying design processes I've ever been in. For me, the act of making is everything. It's sort of, and the act of deciding on the fly and reacting to things and making decisions at the last moment is very much how I, I'm the most comfortable. This is their shop behind the red doors. Um, the guy on the phone is the steel shop manager and the other guy was a, one of the workers. It was just such a special experience because again, in New York or in the US, everyone's like, well, you can't do that. That's going to cost a lot. You know, the jigs are going to cost this much in casting. And so you're constantly running into stopping points and roadblocks. But there, they were just like, all right, I'll cut it off. I'll do it again. And no one spoke English, and I didn't speak their language. So in the end, we were just like pantomiming after for four days. And amazingly enough, we developed close to 10 products in like three or four days because they were so like the urgency and the immediacy was so satisfying. This was basically how all the design happened. There was a small model that I had brought. And then over on the left was a, the translator who, had, who spoke, had a great American accent. So he felt like he was saying everything just right. But in reality, he 
didn't know, he didn't have a great vocabulary. But, um, but we got it done. He did this great weaving techniques. And then he came up with these very unexpected, unusual pieces that I think were, they were designed completely on the fly as we were there. And just, just to have that process and have that sort of magical experience with a culture that's totally different and with people that you don't even speak their language. Um, this is my reward for all the hard work that's been going on over the years. This is our new shop in bed -Stuy. When you think back on that old one, dusty, creepy little place. And now that we have this sort of very European, German style um, design studio. Um, there's a metal shop, and there's the, the archives. Um, a friend of mine brought a drone over one afternoon. So I'll finish the, my lecture with a little view of us from above. So that's where we are today. Again, it's constantly evolving. We'll see where it takes us. But um, yeah, it's been so much fun working with Georgie. Yeah, I think we both come at it from such different points of view. But I, yeah, I think the, um, the personal aspect to it, the sort of sincerity, is one of the things that really kind of, sort of drives both our businesses. So thank you very much. both the kind of, it wasn't influenced by anything really, it was us trying to invent a way to let people talk about design in a really immediate way, so that interface allowed people to really do that exercise really quickly and we could make as many as possible, but it was really just about trying to get people's voice out there. I mean, any there's so many manifestos out there that are interesting to refer back to, but this was just our own take on it. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, also met my wife at Risk, and we actually both designers to work together. I'm wondering if, if you two, is there any, like, bedtime design chat or anything? Like, do you have any totally, kind of design yes. talk? Or yeah, we actually, we do. Actually, we talk more about David's work than we do about mine, coincidentally, because the, the um, new Walker Street shop in Tribeca is, is such an open, format and there's so many possibilities and it's so interesting to kind of think of like what kind of collaboration could you do or what kind of exhibition could you do and so that that's always like a constant source of you know ways to to we've collaborated on that space actually pretty yeah significantly like two by four worked on some of the store design and we did you know we'll do all of the graphics for their events so there's a lot of overlap mm -hmm. in that way um, but I think that's probably what we talk about more than anything, other than our children. Yeah. <laughs> Which take up 90% of yeah, our, exactly. our conversations. Yeah, having 2 by 4 involved with that space is huge. It's, um, think of the retail projects they've done. And it's, and I walked in cold to that. I mean, it was just totally unexpected about what retail really entails. Um, so it's been fantastic being able to sort of communicate with Georgie and getting her feedback. That's right. Come on. Horoscopes. <laughs> I got them. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Who was the favorite project you guys worked on together? Us? Uh, collaborative project you guys did together. Well, I, I think um, I love that picture of David 
on the airplane sketching the gorilla wallpaper because I feel like we, um, you know, he's someone who sketches all the time, unlike me. And uh, I remember looking at it and saying, you should do something with that. It's such a great idea. And talking back and forth. And we had met um, John from Flavor Paper and, you know, just gave him a call and said, like, how would you like to do a wallpaper for us? That was a really fun project, which is really like a kind of total spontaneous, um, you know, moment. Yeah. But I think a lot of the, I think exciting work is sort of like in process right now, which is really this idea of creating more collaborative um, exhibitions in his storefront. So that's like a constant source of, because it could really be anything, and that's the great um, kind of freedom of having your own space, no matter how, it's obviously very difficult, and there's a lot of, you have to constantly be iterating and doing something in that space, so that's the, the hard part, but also the really fun part. Yeah, I think our collaborations are much more subtext in a way. It's, um, you know, two by four, again, I was always so enamored with every project they do, that, you know, just the opportunity to sort of have that resource, and to have that in feedback. I think it's probably the greatest collaboration. I don't think we've done anything specifically. We've never done like a co-authored yeah. anything. Right. But, it's um, a little bit under the radar in a way. Yeah. And actually, like often when I go to Milan uh, to that show, people say like, "Oh, do you work with David?" Or, "Oh, like what do you do?" <laughs> well, I was like, yeah. Yeah. I was like I just, she crushes it every day. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's just more that like there's always this assumption that like somehow I because we do collaborate on stuff like that, that it's, that's what I do, but yeah. it's one of the things I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did you move from, um, both of you were at RISD, but you were a teacher. Right. right. I was graphic design. You were, you were yeah. graphic design, so yes. you stayed within the... Pretty much, yeah. Field. How did you move from, uh, what led you from teaching to light design? Well, I, yeah, when I went to, went to New York, it was in, with every intention of becoming an artist. But again, I think product design felt a little more personal, like price-wise and understanding why, you know, it's always seemed, at least art at the time, sort of seemed so you arbitrary. You sculpture, too, so you kind of had both. Yeah, and it was really... He was in sculpture and then painting, so he kind of had... And the making of stuff is what happened. Yeah. And then working with the jeweler sort of helped clarify all that. And in the end, I think, I think I'm still painting in a sense. It's like, you know, just like changing things and cutting things out and putting new things back in. So the process is still very much a maker's hands-on kind of process. I don't know, my, my biggest problem is finishing. Because <laughs> along the way, it's always like, oh, is this the way too or that way? And so it's um, one of the biggest tricks for me, especially as my business has grown, there's a lot of people standing around expecting to know like, what the final scenario is going to be. So yeah, my biggest challenge is sort of like getting this one done and then that one done. Um, and I'm just practicing currently. I mean, I guess what's always difficult, it's, it's challenging, but it's also just the way the work is, is that a lot of times um, in our studio, you're working with a really big, complex team of people. And so you have you know, your client, and then you have the different teams within the studio, and you have the production team, and all of making all of that happen in a way that actually is seamless and that happens on time and in the way that you creatively want it to happen is like the ultimate challenge and I think I've got I've grown like in my just personal um, kind of skill set from someone who used to be the person making the thing to the person who's kind of like the the vision you know I know what I want to get out of it but like to get that um, involves you know like I was saying to David today 
I'm trying to art direct an illustration on my phone on while I'm walking between two buildings here. I'm like, that's an impossible, it's just not going to work <laughs> kind of task. So I think it's partially, it's that, you know, how do you make a really big, because a lot of our projects are very large scale now, how do you really maintain a really steady, kind of strong design idea when you're really collaborating across so many disciplines and with so many people in and out of the studio? And how do you make that happen in a way that you really feel like you got it right? Um, and that's, you know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But I think, like, the goal is to, to keep working at that and try to figure out how to do that in a, in a way that's successful. Kind of a follow-up to that. Um, Jordi, it's been such a pleasure to get to know your work. Again, as I said before, I knew David from being in sort of you know, similar industry conversations. Um, your, the work that you do engages so many individuals and corporate, private, um, and uh, start attacks, I mean, really quite a range of clients. And yet, one of the things that I'm so impressed by is the um, continuity of sort of vision between all these projects. And so I guess it's a bit of a comment just to say that's amazing that you've managed to cultivate that um, consistency across the projects. And, and I guess the question is, how, did you, how do you manage to do that, wrangling all those incredibly complex um, groups of people? Well, it's super tricky. <laughs> I'm not sure we always do manage it, but I, it's really great to hear you say that because I think a lot of times, you know, some, some studios, I feel like, are really visually consistent and they you see their work and you recognize it and you know that it's that design studio. And that's sort of one, one approach to graphic design, let's say. And I feel like our approach has, has always been like absolutely against that, which is that we're a studio of 50 voices, you know, 50, 49, 52, whatever it ends up being day to day. Um, and we really like, we, we love that we're, that everybody's a little different and we don't have a consistent look, but what we do have is a kind of approach and so I think it's really the process we go through and the kind of critical eye that we have and the kind of rigorousness of the process that, that kind of make everything come together in some way that feels consistent. We don't always see that it feels consistent, so it's good to, to hear that. Um, so I think it's that. You know, but it, it's also a challenge to have two partners, you know, we don't necessarily always work on the same projects together. So that's also saying that three of us with almost disparate, you know, projects are somehow doing that across multiple kinds of visual styles of work. But I think a lot of, um, you know, there's so much for everyone to contribute. Like, I, I rely heavily on my three young design staff for, like, just knowing new things in the world, you know? Because I feel like there's, you, you kind of gain a certain expertise and then to stay in touch with what's going on all the time is incredibly difficult. Um, and so I rely on like my 20 something person who's really into fashion and then my 15 year old son who's really into gaming and then like the, the 36 year old person who's a great architect like to at each level, someone brings something to that process. And I think, in a way, it's like it's like being intelligent about the work in some way and, and really being inclusive and letting those different voices have a part. Does that make sense? Does that ramble yeah. a little? No, no, that's great. <laughs> And I just like how practical he approaches the process. Now there's just, it's very decisive, but it still has this amazing amount of style. 
fit into it? I think he's one of those, the practicing person that's like, out of all those stars in Milan, he's the one who's like, yeah, that's cool, you can be a star. Totally. Helly Angarius. Yeah, Helly Angarius and Patricia Arcoya. Like, people who are really coming up with unusual work that almost doesn't feel like what's going on in the world, like some, somehow it's outside of it. Um, I mean, weirdly, like, when people ask me that, I never think of graphic designers. That's not necessarily because I don't love graphic design, but I, I feel like I look to filmmakers and fashion designers and artists and other people um, just personally more than I do other graphic designers. Um, but I feel like there are you know really interesting digital things going on. Like there's this, this um, group that we're working with right now, and just thinking about different ways of, of creating like motion graphics out of code and. That's the kind of thing I'm really interested in. We mentioned to Josh earlier, someone um, or some showed us this video game um, the other day that's like a, it's called Cuphead. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, and it's sort of like Felix the Cat, but it's a, a like a 15 year old like shooting game basically. And so like these weird mashups of like old culture and new culture and like that, to me those are the most interesting things. And then like, Right now, I'm just obsessed with like the current state of affairs in the world, and like all of the people who are doing amazing, um, like you know, anti-Trump <laughs> graphics. That's what I'm looking to, honestly. So like, I mean, I, I just sort of thrive on like people's like you know, crazy um, political projects right now. Honestly. Yeah, just. <laughs> It's like With Instagram, story. there's so much more opportunity to see things every day, all the time. And just like someone's trip to the Keys, or you know, it's like wherever it is, you're like, oh, that's a great chair in the background. Or, you know, there's like, there's just so much more material and visuals that you get every day. Yeah, it's true. It's like this constant feed of barrage of information and design, and it's a little bit overwhelming in a way. Um, yeah. There's almost too much inspiration all the time. And even when you brought that up, I mean, that was the go-to answer. But it's, I don't truly have, I just as George was saying, like, it's not really designer, it's sort of like products out there that I'm excited about. It's more like the handle came from playing with toys with my kid. You know, it's just sort of like seeing what's around you and kind of like reacting, living with it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sort of like moment of the woman, <laughs> um, 
but it's kind of partially what's going on in the world, partially what's going on in fashion, but not too much, and a little bit of like a million different ideas coming through a million different heads in the studio. So it's there's not really like a clean cut process we go through. It's really about sketching, pinning up, critiquing, showing her, having her critique, having more dialogue around it, and then coming up to something. It's really iterative. It's a really fun project for that reason. Because in a way, like most projects are really about solving a specific problem, you know, or communicating a specific message. So that one feels like this open, like fun thing that we don't have to always solve in the same way. Am I? Oh, I just wanted to know from your perspective in professional practice. What is your view of design education from what you see and what you're aware of? I'm just curious. What do you mean by view of it? Well, the, the state of design education today is different than it was when yeah. you were in school. And yeah. I'm just wondering if you have views on that. Um, well, I mean, I have like little views here and there. I think um, there's certain things that, I don't know, because I feel like there are ways that people work now, which are very different from ways that I was taught to work in it. Like I said, there were no computers even when I was studying at UIC. I think they got from the year I graduated. So my approach has always been like, you know, to kind of sketch something out and figure it out and print it out and look at it printed and like the design staff now, nobody ever prints anything. And like you're looking on the screen at something and I'm like, how do I even know what this
Does anybody here know who Plotkin is? Oh. <laughs> Mr. Plotkin. 